On behalf of the board of directors and the artists of CineQuest, I'm very honored to present you with our Maverick Spirit Award. Its symbol is the originality, the bold spirit, the visionary that does work from their heart and their soul versus a, a formula or a pattern. Congratulations and thank you so much for being with us. Well, it's very, very good to be here, and th thank you for inviting me in this magnificent uh, picture palace, is what we used to call them, and it certainly is one. Um, your work reminds me, you know, it's so hard to make a great film, more difficult to make many great films, and it's very rare that a director makes great films that are, that are different, of different styles and genres and forms and content. I remember uh, Robert Wise is somebody that I also felt did that so brilliantly. And I asked him, okay, well, you make all these different kinds of films. What, what kinds of films do you most enjoy making? And he said, successful ones. <laughs> and I was wondering how you define success as an artist and a director. Well, I think that when you make a film, um, you, you, if it's successful in some degree, um, it means that you can make another one. And that's what I, how I d define success, uh, a film that allows you to do another one. Um, and, you know, an awful lot of very talented people, men and women that I've known, uh, who made a first film that didn't work, and that was the end of it. Um, it's, this is particularly the case, I think, if you, if you make a, a first film that fails, it's very, very hard to have a career. Um, and so I was lucky, I suppose. I, I just uh, managed to squeak by. And of the, of the films, is there one, though, that you feel did not get quite the recognition that you felt it would, or was maybe a, later became more of a cult classic and didn't get the initial recognition? Well, you know, I remember seeing Billy Wilder uh, in Cannes. He just made Buddy Buddy, which turned out to be his last film. And I said, how, how was Buddy Buddy, Billy? And he said, well, John, you know, he said, our, our movies are like our children, you know, and uh, when you, have a new, when you have a kid, you hope he's going to grow up to be Einstein, but sometimes they turn out to be gentle idiots. <laughs> so, I, I've had one or two congenital idiots in my career. <laughs> and if you have a handicapped child, you always rather uh, love that child a bit more than the ones who are fit and well and healthy. Um, I made this film at Zardoz with Sean Connery. <laughs> well, <and> this, this <laughs> you see there's quite a lot of enthusiasm for it. Um, but when, when I'm, it's one, one of those films that went from uh, failure to being a classic without ever passing through success. <laughs> and uh, last week in Los Angeles, um, Fox are uh, restoring it. Um, and it was... The, the cameraman was the great Jeffrey Unsworth, who had a special method of shooting, which gave a kind of a slightly, you know, impressionistic effect, uh, diffused. Um, and it, it was a system that only lasted a few years because um, a number of other uh, cameramen took up this idea, and some beautiful films were made with it. But um, when they submitted it to high-speed printing, the, the negative wouldn't stand up to that. So they, the, the studios forbade cameraman to use that method. So there's just a few years in which films like Zardoz were made. And I thought I'd never see those colors again. And last week at Fox, uh, I worked on it with them and 
they have restored it um, to its former glory. I'm glad to say this is going to be out on Blu-ray shortly. That's great. So, you know, the making of a, a film is a journey, sometimes a long one, an arduous, but what was the, uh, the film that you most enjoyed making? Can you talk to us about that process and why you loved that one? I, I didn't enjoy making any of my films. <laughs> There's too much, too much stress and tension. And, um, I mean, when people say to you, are you making a film? at the moment, they usually mean, are you shooting a film? And of course, the shooting is the shortest part of the entire process. It takes you two or three years to make a film, and probably only eight weeks of that is actually shooting it. And it's always a very tense and, and, and exhausting process. Um, I mean, there are moments of pleasure, there are moments of enchantment, there are moments of revelation, but for the most part, it's very unpleasant. <laughs> I like writing, I like preparing, and I like editing, um, but the, uh, um, the, the, the shooting of the film is the second most unpleasant part of the process. You want to know the, first, the most unpleasant part? <laughs> this is what we're doing right now. <laughs> Well, thank you for doing it, regardless. <laughs> I'm kidding you. <laughs> um, so, you mentioned Billy Wilder. Are there certain artists that really have inspired you in your work, and would you, would you mind talking a bit about them and why? Well, I, I was a, a great fan of uh, silent cinema, and I made a documentary about D.W. Griffith for the BBC, a one-hour documentary. And um, I have an enormous admirer of him, because he and his cameraman, Billy Bitzer, inventing the, uh, invented the whole grammar of film in a few years during the First World War. And you see that in... in uh, I, I'm, I understand you, you played um, uh, Birth of a Nation, um, uh, which is very rarely seen because it has these um, very uh, racist elements in it. And... Um, when I made this documentary for the BBC, I, I wanted them to play uh, Birth of a Nation alongside it or on the following night. And they said they wouldn't do it because of the racist elements. So I said, well, I, I'll, I'll cut the, those out. And they said, no, no, you can't interfere with the work of a great artist. <laughs> and this is, this is sort of, you know, political correctness gone, gone mad. Um, uh, they, they wouldn't allow this great movie to be shown because of the racist elements, and they wouldn't let me cut it. Um, and I pointed out that Griffith actually cut it. He did several versions of that film, depending on where it was being shown. Um, but there you are. are we but, certainly Griffith was an influence on me, but, um, you know, I had the, you know, the great good fortune going to uh, going to Hollywood in the 60s when Hitchcock and Billy Wilder and John Ford were all still working and so I had a kind of direct line back into those great um, great men that's wonderful we have uh the opportunity, week from Friday, we're showing Vidor's The Crowd here with the organ accompaniment, which we're very excited about, a great silent film. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about your, your formative years growing up and how you know, your, your life at that time and how it has influenced these great films, Hope and Glory and Queen and Country? Well, when my, my mother fled, when we lost our house in the war, and we went, my mother took us to the Thames on, at Shepparton, and, and uh, we, um, we, we, this was uh, very close to the Shepparton Film Studios, and I used to watch films being made, and um, I had this ambition to be a clapper loader. A clapper loader, I, you don't use that term in American uh, movies, but it, 
the clapper loader is the guy who does the clapper, you know, and it also loads the film in the camera. And he's at the, at the very bottom rung of a film crew. And I desperately wanted to be a clapper loader. And I applied to all the studios and I got turned down by them all. And so I had to become a director instead. <laughs> It's great. As you, as you write or direct or, or make a film, what role does the audience play in that process? Any? Do you, do you think of the audience as you're making the film? or Not really. When I'm writing, well, particularly in Hope and Glory, this sort of autobiographical films, um, I, start, I start by just putting down all my most vivid memories of incidents and um, characters and I start to move them around and play around with them and <clears throat> no I never think of an audience um, I never think of a, no I don't really um, uh, I what I do is you know the, it's rather the, the relationship between memory and um, and imagination is very mysterious um, and what what I my guiding principle really was when I'm writing and when I'm shooting and when I'm working with actors is I always ask myself the question is is it truthful is it I'm always and if, if the answer is yes it's truthful I, I, it stays in if it's not um, out it goes so I remember Ingmar Bergman saying um, in my presence he said um, he was asked what he was looking for when he was making a film and he said I'm not looking for reality or for the real I'm looking for for it to be alive and I always thought that was very very interesting um, because this, the search for reality in film is, is um, bound to fail because film is not reality. Film is something else. It's a, a contiguous world. It's a parallel world. It's, um, it's um, in the end, it's, you know, a light flickering on a wall. And um, to search for, as people do, to make it more real, more believable, and it's all futile. It's a futile search. Truth is what you look for. Let's see. Uh, we're in the land of technology here, Silicon Valley. What role has technology played in your work, or in, in how has it influenced your work through time, if any? Well, when I, before CGI, uh, I, for instance, when I made Excalibur, which had lots of effects in it, um, I worked, uh, I studied all the, I had <clears throat> the opportunity of working with some of the great uh, special effects men of Hollywood and making up effects in the old traditional way, which have completely lost now because there's the no need for those processes. You can do it all on the computer. But for instance, um, in Excalibur, <clears throat> I was using um, the ghost glass, which is uh, an old technique where you put an optical glass at an angle of 45 degrees to the lens, and then you can put, cover it with black, and put an object in there, which you can uh, then superimpose on the, the scene you're looking at. And I use that all the way through the film, all sorts of situations, um, and many other techniques which are now completely lost. Now, in, in terms of modern technology, uh, there's a, you know, the raging debate about whether uh, people who, who hung on to the idea of keeping film and those who went to digital, um, I couldn't wait to go to digital. I, I, I had s so much pain inflicted on me by film in my life. Uh, you know, the, the, 
the, the lab um, scratches it or make, it comes back dirty or they lose shots, um, uh, uh, awful. And digital gives us the opportunity to grade the film afterwards. We can paint, we can make anything of it we want. It's a marvelous facility and it's transformed the way films look much more than CGI has. Um, and cameramen were, you know, against it at first because they felt it impinged on their, their craft, their art, but they all embrace it now because um, it's, you know, I tell you, it's, it's night shooting. Um, how many nights have I spent shooting, hundreds of nights I've been out shooting, and, and, and you spend the first two, you know, in the night shoot, you put up a, a, a big lamp on a crane to give the effect of a kind of moonlight, and this causes flares, and you, the first three or four hours of the night, you spend putting flags up to get rid of these flares. Now, now we, all we do, we, we can just, we don't worry about that, we can paint them out afterwards. So, things like that make, makes uh, filmmaking much more pleasant. No, it's not pleasant, I don't, I'm sorry. I, uh, <laughs> le less unpleasant, I should say. <laughs> That's great. In your autobiography, uh, there's a quote that you said you, you feel you could achieve through film, it's possible to achieve a radiance, a transcendence. Can you speak a little more? Towards that, I, I love that quote. Well, I think when, when you, st every time you start a new film, I mean, you, you feel that somehow, somehow, you know, this is going to be the great one. This is the film that's going to transcend, it's going to sweep the audience up and into the film, and they're going to lose their bearings, and they're going to disappear into the film, and it's going to bring them revelation and transcendence, and of course it never does. Um, but um, I'm, well, David, David Lean was a great friend of mine, and, and when he, he, was, he was trying to make Nostromo when he fell sick, he got cancer. And uh, I was with him a few days before he died, and he said to me, um, John, um, I do hope I'll get well enough to make this movie, because I feel I'm just beginning to get the hang of it. <laughs> and, and I think that's that feeling, that's the same feeling I was describing, the feeling that this time, you know, this time we're gonna do something astonishing. And so, well, I've run out of time, so. I'm 82 and I don't know, that, that, that one has escaped me. I, I know that you wanna take a few questions here from our, our wonderful folks that are here with us. And I did, somebody already gave me one question, so uh, they wanted you to speak to their favorite film, Point Blank, that they felt just was uh, so far ahead of its time. Can you talk about that, that film and why you made it and the process and experience? Well, it, it was, I made it very much uh, with Lee Marvin. He was, um, made a huge contribution to that film. Um, and uh, when we met in London, he was, he was making The Dirty Dozen in London and uh, this producer gave us this script and he, we met and Lee said, what do you think of this script? I said, it's really feeble. And he said, well, what, why are we meeting then? I said, well, look, the character is interesting. And we met a number of times. And he had been in the Pacific War. He was a sniper, actually. And he was traumatized by, by it. He brutalized, I would say, more. Um, and this character in Point Blank, who's shot and left for dead and comes back looking for his money, which is a, a metaphor for his humanity, really. Um, and, and, and it was very much Lee, it paralleled Lee's experience, and that's what attracted him to it. And so 
we had this ghastly script. So one night we were in his apartment in London on the sixth floor, and he said to me, okay, John, I'll make this flick with you. He always called them flicks. On one condition. And he picked the script up and he threw it out of the window. <laughs> well, Mel Gibson did a remake of this uh, of Point Blank. And um, he w was courteous enough to send me the script of this remake. Um, and I, I read it and it, it very much resembled the script that Lee threw out of the window. <laughs> <laughs> and I can only imagine that a very young Mel Gibson was passing by and picked it up out of the gutter. <laughs> but Lee, so we went, um, when I got out there, Lee understood much better than I did how difficult it was going to be to make a film which in Hollywood terms was quite radical. And he called a meeting with the head of the studio and... Um, the producers, and he said, he reminded them that he had script approval and cast approval. He just won the Academy Award and he was very hot. And he said, I, I defer those approvals to John. And he turned on his heel and he left, left me standing there with these men glaring at me with these malicious eyes, uh, realizing they'd lost control of this film before it started. So we were able to do it. Um, and I think I made it in a kind of state of grace. Um, uh, somehow, somehow, uh, Lee and I worked, um, so closely together that we, when we were shooting, we hardly, hardly spoke because we'd worked everything out beforehand. Everything was, and it just, just worked. And he was, um, one, right towards the end of the film, we were shooting on Alcatraz and I was exhausted. And we'd just come up from Los Angeles on the previous day, night, and I just, I just couldn't work the scene out. I blanked out. And Lee came over to me and said, um, are you in trouble? I said, I, I, yeah, I, I just, I don't have I've got to work this thing out. And he went, went away and started roaring and shouting and falling on the floor, acting drunk. Um, and uh, the production manager came over to me and said, look at the state Lee's in, you can't possibly shoot on him like that and we'll get him some black coffee or something, you know. And once the pressure was off, I, could, I solved the problem very, you know, in a couple of minutes. And I went over to Lee and, I, and he made this incredible recovery from drunkenness to sobriety in about 30 seconds. That's fabulous. So we're going to take some questions, please. If you wouldn't mind raising your hand, I'll, I'll call on you and then I'll Repeat the question. Please say it loudly, but just in case folks can't hear it. Love to hear from you. Yes, ma'am. The Emerald Forest was ahead of its time. How do you feel about what's happening to the rainforest today? Well, yes. I mean, I, I made that partly because I, I, I was very concerned about about the the Amazonian rainforest, and I, I spent a lot of time traveling through it, and it's magnificent. Uh, and, uh, and to see it being cut down and was pretty horrible, but um, I got over that, actually, because um, I realized that cutting down the rainforest was a, a very bad th thing for us, the human race, but it didn't matter that much to the rainforest because in a thousand years it could replenish itself. And a thousand years is not very much time in, in the life of a forest. Um, and the, it, it will come back, but not in our time.
Questions? Please. Uh, great fan of Zardos. Are the characters supposed to represent different philosophies? Say that again. Uh, the the characters of Zardos represent different philosophies. Is that correct? That is correct. I'm not quite sure I understand that. What's he saying? He wants he, if, if, if the characters in the movie Zardos uh, represent different philosophies. In which film? Zardos. Oh, in Zardos. Well, I <clears throat> I've never quite understood that film. Uh, but my, my starting point of it was that, you know, you could see how um, the, the well-off had, you know, better medicine and lived longer lives than the poor and that that tendency was going to increase and I thought if you extended that idea uh, into the future you could see that medicine medical science could solve the problem of aging and death uh, and you so have an elite which becomes immortal and the rest of the world kind of um, uh, reg regresses into a kind of br brutalism and that was so that was the concept and then I just, um, you know, uh, developed the idea from that. Um, and whether the, you know, the, whether uh, Im immortality is something that would be, uh, um, uh, that we would enjoy or not. I th and I, in the end, I thought, well, probably not. You know, we'd, we'd get, people get, we'd get tired of it. Um, and um, uh, so the, the idea that immortality would, would, of course, eliminate sexual desire because there's no point in having children if you can live forever. Um, and also the idea that sleep would disappear. And so these these elements then suggest a society which you see in the film. Um, now, I was asked a number of questions about this film, and when I said, I said lightheartedly, I didn't understand it. I think um, it's films that we don't quite understand are usually worthwhile. And I don't understand everything about it, but I do understand some things. And one of the one of the things that you, people are always asking me questions about it. You know, uh, for instance, I, I'm often asked, "How did you persuade Sean Connery to wear a wedding dress in the film?" And I said, "Well, it, I use the same method I use for telling." four actors to get in these canoes and drive, go, go down the uh, cataract, you know, uh, which is to say, okay, um, okay, in this scene, uh, you four, you get into those two canoes and you go down those rapids and I walk away, I walk away <laughs> before they can say anything. And um, the same thing with um, the wedding dress. I said, oh, Sean, you see this wedding dress? You wear that in the next scene, I walk away. <laughs> And uh, Hitchcock uh, used this method. He would, um, he would go, go up to an actor and he'd point to the script. He'd point to a word in the script and he'd say, dog's feet. And the, act, and the actor would say, uh, dog's feet. Oh, pause, he wants me to pause. Um, and uh, by the time he's worked it out, Hitchcock had left, he had, so he couldn't argue about it. <laughs> I know one, a new one director always had a crane on the set so that if he saw an actor coming up to him, he would get on the crane and lift, have himself lifted up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
That's awesome. <laughs> um, more questions? Please. Um, uh, we, I, I heard your daughter has made a film about you. I'd like to know what you think of it and also how we can see it. His daughter's made a film about him. What does he think about it and how can we see it? Well, it, it, it's, I find it acutely embarrassing. And uh, so I'm not that keen for you to see it, but, um, <laughs> but uh, I, she, my daughter, she has ambitions to direct, so she wanted to get some experience. And she came to me and she said, Dad, if I, if I do a documentary about you and you can um, do a, a kind of master class as we go along, you can... And so... I, well, I did that. So as we, you know, we, he was setting up, I'd say, no, no, you know, don't put the camera there because the lighting is all wrong. You know, just move around. And I, and anyway, she, what she did, she kept the camera running while I was telling all these things. And so she included all the, the embarrassing things that I did, um, and excluded all the very intelligent <laughs> elements and if, you know you can never trust a daughter <laughs> question okay over here The question is, how do you pick your director of photography? How do you decide on the style with them and shooting? The process. Well, I've, been, I, I've had the privilege of working with some great um, cinematographers. Conrad Hall, who did um, Excalibur, Phil Lathrop, who did Point Blank, um, Velvet Sigmund, who did uh, Deliverance, and um, Seamus DC, this, this is one you've just seen. And, well, of course, you know, you, you work very closely with the cameraman, and, and as with everything, um, most of the work is done before you go on to the set. Uh, that is to say, you decide on the color palette, uh, which is going to influence the, uh, the way it looks. And you also, when you're choosing the locations and, build and designing the sets, uh, the starting point is always where the light is. Where's the light coming from? Um, and uh, it's, once the light source, once you've decided and where the light source is, everything builds from that. Um, and so the, you, you, you do that work with, a, uh, with the cameraman. And he, of course, can only, he can only film what is set before him. And basically, if you, if you point your camera at something beautiful, you will tend to get a beautiful shot. Um, it's complex. Um, it's, you know, I think, I think when you start out, a lot, of, a lot of first films are quite good. You know, some turn out very well. And it's because the director, you know, he, has, he probably has a, a vision, um, but he doesn't perhaps have the experience to bring it off. But he blunders into it. And out of ignorance, he somehow gets through it, and he has help, and he gets through it, and it works. Um, when you get more experience, you tend to be a little more cautious because you think, well, I won't do that because if, if it rains, uh, then we could lose a day, so we maybe do it and put it that scene in, in a room and things like that. You become a bit more cautious. And then as you eventually 
master your, cla your, your craft and you are in command of all the elements that make up a film, um, you then become much more daring again because you know you have the ability to get out of trouble, whatever happens. And so this cycle goes around. And, and the, 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 the element of the, the working with a cameraman is one of the pleasures. You know, I, I, I've, I said rather lightheartedly that, you know, it's not enjoyable making, shooting a film. But what I take from my career most of all is the collaborations I've had with actors and cameramen and designers. Uh, uh, th that's been the most rewarding part of the whole process for me. Final question, please. Is it right here in the white? The, the idea of a lot of uh, directors find a story, they, the, the, then they go to Hollywood to package it with the actors is a process. How do you work to make your story real? Well, um, it, obviously you start with the script, um, which for I, most part I'm doing it myself. And then um, you start thinking about um, actors, casting. And casting is very painful because when you've written a script, you have the vision of the film and it's, it belongs to you at that point. As soon as you cast it, every actor you cast is, is never going to be quite like the character you've envisaged. So every time you cast a part, you're giving a bit of the film away. And and as you bring other collaborators into the process, um, they add something or take something away, it alters and changes. And the film, you, you, you must learn not to fight to keep your vision uh, pure. You have to learn to uh, accept the changes and evolve that goes on. And it's, it, Good, most films do evolve. They just grow and change and alter. And, and it's, you, you have to embrace that. And, um, and sometimes it comes out better than you imagine. Mostly it falls short a little bit, but um, uh, it's just the, the, the way films function. Well, I would uh, like to say that I believe we all feel very strongly that your films have done for us, that, given us that experience of radiance and transcendence. And please uh, join me in thanking once again John Borman. Thank you so much for being here.